start for some. <laughs> Bismillah, we're going to get started, insha'Allah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. How's everyone doing? Last few days of Ramadan, inshallah. Hopefully everyone's um, ready to go. If not, I hope this talk will benefit. But before we start off, inshallah, I just have a few disclaimers. Um, first one is, when I was given this opportunity, alhamdulillah, to do this talk, I was told that there's a halaqa after Dhuhr that we'll be doing every Sunday. Do you mind taking one of the Sundays? Would you love to do it? And I'm like, that's a great opportunity. Jazakallah khair and I'll do it. I was expecting it to be that, you know, everyone prays Dhuhr, then the Imam gets up, turns around, five minutes, ten minutes, they give a short talk, they give a khatra. So I was like, okay, yeah, I can do this, inshallah. And then, like, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I get this notification that Imam Sharif, he just finished his halaqa. And I'm like, let me benefit, let me learn. So I open up YouTube, and um, one hour, 22 minutes. He spoke for one hour, 22 minutes sitting up here. So bear with me, be a bit patient, inshallah. But um, I'm excited for today. I'm very excited. Then the second disclaimer is Sheikh Sufyan Sen. For anyone who knows Sheikh Sufyan Sen, he's the imam of the Cham refugee community masjid here in Seattle. He actually had a discussion on the same topic last week in UW. So I attended that, alhamdulillah. And I've gotten quite a few things from his talk, which I will mention, uh, but just take it that my first, I think, half of my talk, a lot of it is going to be based on what Sheikh Sufyan said. Okay, Rabbi Shahili Sadri wa Yisidli Amri wa Ahlul Aqdatan min Lisani Yafqahu Qawli. My talk, I'm going to be splitting it up into three um, parts because everyone, all of us have spoken about, we've learned about what we have to do these last 10 days, these last 10 nights, what the importance is and whatnot. So I've split it up into three primary discussions. The first one is going to be the virtue of the last 10 nights. We've heard about it again a lot of times, so I'm going to mention it very briefly, what the virtue is of these last 10 nights and then Laylatul Qadr specifically. Then we're going to uh, speak about second on practical areas of focus in these last 10 nights. What can we do that are practical action items, inshallah, that we can start practicing today itself for these last 10 nights. And then I'll finish off with what is the spirit of these last 10 nights. So the first two will take up maybe half of the discussion, and then the last one will take up possibly the second half of the discussion. And the first two, I'd say the majority is based off of what I learned from Sheikh Sufyan. So bear with me, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So to start off, what is the virtue of these last 10 nights? We're going to rush through this a little bit to save time, inshallah. The first thing is when we talk about night in Islam, it starts after Maghrib. Right? So when after as in when Maghrib comes in, that's when the night starts. All the way up until Fajr, right? So Maghrib until Fajr is the night. Throughout the month of Ramadan, what we've been accustomed to is that when we're fasting throughout the day, that's from Fajr until Maghrib. When we're fasting throughout the day, we stay away from saying bad things. We stay away from we stay away from looking at bad things. We try to stay away from even thinking about bad things. For the people who are here for the first halaqa, Imam Sharif's, he spoke about how Imam Ghazali split up fasting into three kinds, into three levels. And the highest level of fasting is not only staying away from food, water, and um, permissible uh, pleasure, but also from staying away from any thoughts that take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So only thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these first 20 days, that's all we've been trying to do in the day, is when we fast, stay away from all of this, but also stay away from bad speech and bad thoughts. The purpose of these last 10 days is to take you into overdrive and tell you that not only are you going to do that in the day, you should now start focusing on doing the same things in the night as well. We should have already in the past 20 days and 20 nights tried to stay away from anything that's evil, even during the night, even when we're not fasting. But when we're fasting, there's an extra effort. When someone swears at us, when someone's trying to fight, we say, Inni Saim, I'm fasting. 
But now with these last 10 nights, since the virtue lies in these last 10 nights, right? The fasting is of course in the day, but the virtue lies in these last 10 nights. We take it even more important that we stay away from the things that we're staying away while fasting during the nights as well. Of course, not food, not water, but bad speech, bad thoughts, those kinds of things. And this is known, of course, but it's beneficial to mention it. So the night begins, begins after Maghrib, ends at Fajr, and then the day starts from Fajr until Maghrib, which means around the clock, during the day you're fasting, during the night you're trying to look for Laylatul Qadr. Then the second virtue of the last t- these last 10 nights is, according to a few of the scholars, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by these last 10 nights. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by something in the Qur'an, it shows the emphasis and the importance of that particular thing. So in Surah Al-Fajr, Wal-Fajr wa Layalin Ashr, by the 10 nights. Some ulama, I'd say I think the majority, say that these 10 refer to the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. But a few of them, right, I believe Ibn Abbas is amongst them, a few of them say that these, last, these 10 nights refer to the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath by these last 10 nights, we have to understand how important they are and how much emphasis Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting into those nights. We have, of course, that the night of Laylatul Qadr is most probably in these last 10 nights. If you guys didn't know, um, it said that Laylatul Qadr could possibly be any of the days in Ramadan, any of the nights in Ramadan. Okay? Sheikh Sufyan actually mentioned something which was, I'd never heard before, but um, very, very fascinating. He said that some scholars, very minority opinion, right? But some scholars actually mentioned that there is a tiny possibility that Laylatul Qadr could be one of the nights of the entire year, any. Because the Ramadan, it keeps moving back every single year, right? And then the lunar calendar also is such that it might differ by a day or not. So he says that there's a few ulama, very, very, very minority opinion, but they say that Laylatul Qadr could be any of the last, any of the nights of the year. Then a bigger portion of them say that it could be any of the nights of Ramadan. A much bigger of the portion says that it could be any of the last 10 nights of um, Ramadan. Then a few more amongst them say that it's one of the odd nights. And then a few more amongst them say that it's possibly the 27th night. All right. However, when I say that it's the 27th night, I'm just saying that because it is mentioned in our ahadith, it's mentioned by the ulama or whatnot. But everyone says that you have to hunt for these last 10 nights. And it's a hadith of the Prophet wasallam that look for Laylatul Qadr in these last 10 nights. Hunt for Laylatul Qadr in these last 10 nights. So don't just gaslight yourself into thinking that no, 27th is Laylatul Qadr, so I'm going to reserve all of my worship, I'm going to reserve all of my du'as, I'm going to reserve all of my khatams for the 27th night, and I'm not going to do anything else on these separate days. That's not proper. To do extra on the 27th night because there is some potential that there is a higher level of, um, there's a higher possibility that 27th is Laylatul Qadr, so to, you do more on that night, there's nothing wrong with that. But to do less intentionally on other nights, that's when there's an issue because there's a possibility that you miss the night. But then also, we started on our fast, first fast according to this masjid was Monday, right? But a few other masajid in our community itself, in Washington, but also across America, a few other masajid started their first fast on Tuesday. So there's a possibility that what is the 27th for us is not the 27th for someone else. Or what is the 27th for, for them is not the 27th for us. So make sure that you don't restrict your worship to that one night and make sure you're kind of expanding your worship, inshallah. We'll get to some of those practical tips, but one of the virtues of the last 10 nights is Laylatul Qadr. About Laylatul Qadr, we all know in the surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Khairu min alfi It's better than a thousand months. In the Quran and especially in um, Arabic, Numbers are used a lot of the times for hyperbole, right? Numbers are mentioned to kind of emphasize things, but not particularly to say exactly a thousand months, right? So when you read a number in the Quran or when you hear of a number that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, a lot of the times it is a general estimate. It's a general 
importance that the Prophet is ascribing to something. So when we say these thousand months, people do the math and say 83, 83 years or something. But then not only would that not be correct from the mathematical perspective, in the sense that the number doesn't typically mean exactly that amount, but even the wording itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ That's It's even better than a thousand months. So don't put a limit on how much reward there is in this night. There's an immense, immense amount of rewar uh, reward in this night. The Sahaba would often ask the Prophet ﷺ that how is it that we can compare to the lives of the pious people in the past? Nuh ﷺ lived for more than 950 years. Adam Salam lived for hundreds of years. These other prophets, other people in the past lived for a very long time. So the Sahaba would question the Prophet ﷺ saying, how is it that we can match them in their deeds when they lived for so long and we just have a couple of years. We have 60 years, 50 years, maybe if you're lucky, 85, 90 years. And the Prophet ﷺ, he would remind them that our days are not the same as their days. Our prayers, we get more reward for them, right? The five prayers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you get a lot more reward for those five prayers if you do them consistently. This night itself, if you think about it, right? If you do the math, which I just mentioned we shouldn't do, but if you do the math, um, let's say for 50 years, you've been worshipping consistently for the last 10 nights of Ramadan, which means, inshallah, you've been getting Laylatul Qadr for every single year in your 50 years, and it's at least 83 years worth of reward, at least, right? Khairun min al better than a thousand months, so it's at least a thousand months. If you do the math, that's a very, very, very long life, right? So it's a very long life. Make the most of this night. Make the absolute most of this night. Insha'Allah, I'm of the genuine um, belief, right? I haven't read this anywhere, so forgive me. But I believe sincerely that if you try your best on every single night in Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you immensely, maybe not at the level of Laylatul Qadr, but much, 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 much higher than any other night just because you're hunting for Laylatul Qadr. So even if you don't find Laylatul Qadr on a specific night, know that your reward for that night that you're worshipping is being multiplied tenfold, a hundredfold. Insha'Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. There's no limit on how much he'll reward us with. Sheikh Sufyan mentioned this, um, another point, which again, I found very, very beautiful. He said that if you notice throughout the year and throughout the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he's done things with the prophets of the past, is Fasting has typically been seen as, or be, typically been done as a way of celebration, right? The Prophet ﷺ, in some ahadith, he would say that he fasted Mondays. It was a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to fast Monday and Thursday. The Prophet ﷺ would say that he would fast Monday because he was born on a Monday, right? So he would celebrate the fact that he was born by, being, by fasting on that Monday, all right? So that's one way of where fasting is a form of celebration for, cer for a certain thing. When it comes from Muharram, you have to fast um, 10 days, right? The first 9th, uh, you know, sorry, not 10 days. You have to fast 9th, 10th, or 10th and 11th for Muharram to celebrate the victory that Musa salam had over Fir'aun. And the Prophet salam said that the purpose of us fasting on this day is because we're celebrating the victory that Musa salam had. Sheikh Sufyan mentioned that some of the ulama, and he also very strongly believes this, is the Qur'an being revealed in the month of Ramadan is such a beautiful thing for us as mankind. It's such a massive gift, it's such a big deal, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in order to celebrate for the revelation of the Qur'an, I'm giving you this entire month to fast. I'm telling you to fast for this entire month, Simply for the fact, yes, for, to gain taqwa, to gain all of those things that the Qur'an mentions, but also as a celebration of the revelation of the Qur'an. So he says that when you spend this month, and when you intentionally think about the fact that you're fasting to celebrate the Qur'an, you tend to increase your relationship with the Qur'an. Every single one of us knows that there is a direct correlation, a direct connection with the Qur'an and the month of Ramadan. The Qur'an was revealed in the month of Ramadan. Uh, there's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ actually that every single book that was revealed, so Torah, Injil, Zabur, um, revelation in the past, started off in the month of Ramadan, right? 
So every single scripture in the past started off in the month of Ramadan. The Quran itself started off in the month of Ramadan. We know that the Prophet وسلم, every single Ramadan, Jibreel وسلم, would come to him and they would review the Quran with each other. And in his last year, he reviewed it twice. So we know the correlation of this month with the Quran. So Sheikh Sufyan says that fasting, one of the purposes, one of the wisdoms of fasting in this month is to celebrate that revelation of the Quran. So when you're fasting, we've got only nine days, I think, nine, ten days fasts left. Make sure you're thinking about that. And what happens when you celebrate something is you tend to do that thing more, right? You notice, unfortunately, forgive me for using this example, okay? But we live in this land, so that's why I'm going to use it. We recently had St. Pat Patrick's Day. What does every, everyone do on St. Patrick's Day? Everyone wears green, not Muslims, right? Everyone wears green, generally. Um, it's because you're celebrating, I don't know why St. Patrick is associated with green, but everyone wears green because that's something it's associated with St. Patrick, so they do more of that thing on that day. So when you recognize that we're celebrating the Qur'an in this month of Ramadan, automatically, naturally, the human tendency is you spend more time with the Qur'an. So it's a good way to look at things, it's a good way to approach things, and understand that this month is directly, directly correlated with the Qur'an, especially these last 9 and 10 days, inshallah. Um, so the reason why you're fasting is to celebrate the revelation of the Qur'an. Before we move on into the next thing, the practical areas of focus, Sheikh Sufyan mentioned to remember five Ps. Okay, five Ps. He said, proper preparation prevents poor performance. SubhanAllah. Okay, so proper preparation pre prevents poor performance. So if you don't have a plan set out for the next 10 days, 9 days, 8 days, whatever it is, make sure that today, inshallah, after whatever you listen, after what I mentioned, the next few things, make sure before you leave the masjid, set up a basic plan, all right? If you're reading maybe one juz a day, step that up to maybe two or three juz a day. If you're doing 20 raka'ah in taraweeh, if you're doing eight raka'ahs in taraweeh in the masjid, make it a point to pray more than that at home. But whatever it is, set a goal for yourself. Ideally, the way you should be doing ibadah in these last 10 nights is not to hit a certain goal, but to cover your time. Anytime you're free, anytime you notice that you have free time, you're trying to do as much as you can. What happens sometimes when you set a goal is you do your one juz, you still have an hour, but somehow you're satisfied with that one juz because to you, you've met your goal. Versus sometimes when you don't set a goal, what happens is you just keep reading and reading and reading and reading. But there's also a risk that if you don't set a goal, you're not going to read at all because you don't really have something to reach. So these last 10 days, poor, let me read it again, sorry. Po proper pep preparation prevents poor performance, okay? So set a plan right now for the last remaining eight, nine days of Ramadan and stick with it, try to do more than that, but most definitely try not to fall short of that, inshallah. So the second is practical areas of focus. We're gonna give you, I'm gonna give you five areas of focus that Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Sufyan mentioned as well. And then I'll try to expand on them very quickly as well. The first one, uh, of course, is Salah. This month, you want to spend as much time as you can praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's different ways of praying, but the first one primarily is your obligated five daily um, prayers, your Salah. Your Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Aisha. There is absolutely no excuse for you to miss one of your fard any time across the year, but especially in this month. That includes your qiyam and your taraweeh. Okay? And don't take this as a way to not attend qiyam or not pray your taraweeh, but take it as a way to emphasize the importance of your fajr and your asha. If you find yourself oversleeping because you just prayed, two and a half hours of Qiyam, which is incredible, mashallah, may Allah reward you, but you fell asleep before Fajr and then you missed Fajr, and you've noticed that this has become a habit, it is much, much, much better for you to stop praying that long of a Qiyam, pray maybe half an hour, to make sure that you don't miss Fajr. Fajr is Fard, absolute obligation. Qiyam, Taraweeh, and these night prayers are Sunnah, they're Nafil, they're recommended, they're immensely rewarded, but if you leave them, there's no sin. Right? But you don't want to leave them, of course. But if you leave them, there's no sin. Make sure you're attending 
your five daily prayers, either in the masjid, if you can do the masjid, pray, try to do jama'ah at home if you're married, if you have siblings at home, if you can do that, pray individually, but no excuse for missing any of your faraid. Everyone knows that, but it's beneficial to, I guess, remind again. If you're good with your faraid, you need to start cushioning those with your sunnahs and your nafils. I say cushioning because the ulama mentioned that when you start making it a habit to pray your nafil, right? So fard, sunnah, and then nafil. When you make it a habit to start praying your nafil, the days that you're tired and you don't feel like doing everything that you typically do on a regular day, what are you gonna do? Uh, what are you gonna do? You're gonna drop your nafil prayer. So you're still praying your fard and sunnah. You're dropping your nafil prayer and you're saving yourself maybe two, three, four, five minutes, which shaitan again convinces you is a lot of time, which it really isn't. But at least you're not dropping all of it because that's a massive leap. When you only have a habit of praying fard and sunnah, what happens on the days that you feel tired is that you start dropping your sunnah. You're still doing your fard, alhamdulillah, you're still doing the bare minimum, but you drop your sin sunnah because somehow you convince yourself that this is saving me time. And sometimes it does save you. Um, if when you're in a pickle, you have to pray your fard and run. So you drop your sunnah. When you have the habit of only praying your fard, you never pray your sunnahs, you never pray your nafil, you never do any of God, you never sit after salah. Anytime you're tired, the only thing that's left for you to drop is your fard. And that's what shaitan convinces you to do. Shaitan somehow convinces you that you're really tired today, you have a lot of things on your plate, let's take some time to rest, drop your fard prayer. So the ulama mentioned that you have to cushion your prayers Pray your fard, then make it a habit to pray sunnah, and make it a habit to pray nafil. Then make it a habit to sit after salah and do some adhkar, maybe read some Qur'an. So that when you get tired, you're not dropping what's the bare minimum, you're dropping something that you're doing extra. Yes, question Habibi. Difference between sunnah and nafil, it's a good question. Um, sunnah is something that the Prophet ﷺ would almost never, for him especially, especially, would almost never miss. And he particularly emphasized sunnah. And then nafil, like for example, they said there's 12 sunnahs, right? Nafil are prayers that the Prophet ﷺ would make sometimes, most of the times, and then sometimes not make as well. And um, there's a higher level of reward doing it. Not, not more than sunnah, but there's a higher level of reward doing it since it's not something that you have to do. Um, Imam Akram, if you want to add to that, inshallah, you can. Perfect, Jazakallah khairan. Yeah, so if you guys couldn't hear, sunnah is stuff that are described by the Prophet Sallallahu so the 12 um, total, and then nafil is not described so you can do as much as you want, that will qualify as nafil, inshallah. So make sure you're cushioning your prayers with your sunnahs and your nafils, then adhkar and then Quran after, inshallah. Focus on the Quran, the second point. So first out of the five is focus on your salah. Second is focus on your Quran. This month is directly correlated with the Qur'an. We'll talk more about this in the last kind of spirit of the last 10 nights, a more spiritual discussion, inshallah. The Qur'an, um, some ulama mentioned this, Sheikh Sufyan mentioned, and then I looked it up uh, because it was so, so profound, subhanAllah. He mentioned that some ulama say that even looking at the Qur'an can serve as an act of worship. When you look at it intentionally, you're looking at the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're thinking to yourself, SubhanAllah, this is something that my Rabb has delivered to me. He's speaking to me in this Qur'an. So even looking at the Qur'an is something that can serve as an act of worship. Right? When people struggle to read the Qur'an, the Prophet ﷺ says that someone who struggles to read the Qur'an, your reward is twice that of someone who's fluent in reading it. Someone who doesn't even know how to read Arabi or doesn't even know how to read the Qur'an, even looking at it, inshaAllah, can serve as a means of reward. My mom used to tell me this story that her grandmother told her from her village. Now, I, I don't know if this is something her grandmother kind of experienced herself, right? If it's someone she knows from her village, or it's a story that's passed down, you know, cultural stories, traditional stories and stuff. But she mentioned that there was this blind lady in the village, okay? She's blind, and this is a village back home in India. There's no, you know, there's no braille. There's no mechanism for someone who's blind to read. So there was this blind lady, and after every salah, or after every prayer, every single day, 
she would sit down with the Quran and people would watch her with the Quran for like minutes and minutes and hours on end. So someone said, what is she doing? She can't read. Why is she sitting with the Quran? And she, she would sit with the pages open and she would flip through the pages and she'd trace the lines. So one of them went and sat next to her and they could hear her repeating one thing over and over and over again. I'm going to mention it in Urdu first, okay? Since usually it has more impact in its original language and then I'll translate it. She would go over each one of the lines in the Quran and all she would say was Ye bi sahihe, Ye bi sahihe, Ye bi sahihe. Subhanallah. All she would be saying was tracing it and she would say even this is correct, even this is correct, even this is correct. And they asked her later, why do you say that? She says that I know that this book was revealed to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My iman and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger is so high. My love for them is so dear that even though I can't read the Qur'an, I know for a fact that anything mentioned in the Qur'an is true. So she would sit with the Qur'an hours every single day and she would just say that even this is correct, even this is correct, even this is correct. She knows nothing except the fact that this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. Imagine how beloved that action would be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we think about it, right, our hearts waver, we have, we have tears in our eyes, just thinking about something like that, imagine how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that action. So when you struggle to do something, when you struggle to read the Qur'an, sometimes your voice dries up, your throat dries up when you're fasting, you can't drink water, just sit there with the Qur'an, right? Some, you, you notice our elders, they have so much respect for the Qur'an, they cover it with clots when they're putting it down, they hold it and then you know, they place it at the highest level so that there's no form of disrespect and stuff. That level of respect, that level of ihtiram for the Qur'an is a must. So these last 10 days, these last 10 nights, as Shaykh Sufyan mentioned, you're celebrating the revelation of the Qur'an by fasting, spend that time with the Qur'an, even looking at it as a form of worship. So what about thinking about it? What about pondering upon it? What about reading it? So spend as much time as you can in the Qur'an, with the Qur'an. The third thing is dhikr and dua, all right? Mention the name of Allah a lot. Make that consistent on your tongue. Mention the name of Allah. Make a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, in the passage of Ramadan, in Surah Baqarah, um, I think it starts at uh, 185, 186, somewhere there, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the benefits and purposes of Ramadan. One of the primary things that he mentions is dua. إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةُ الدَّعِي The whole ayah, mashallah, it talks about dua. That when my, say, my servant asks you about me, tell them that I'm close to him and I'm always there to answer your dua. To ask a lot, a lot of dua in this month. We'll get back to kind of the desperation that we need to have when we're getting, making dua in the last portion. But make a lot of dua and make a lot of dhikr. A buzzword in kind of our time and age is affirmations. Daily affirmations, self-affirmations. One of our teachers, Imam Akram Anais, he says that dhikr serves as a form of your self-affirmation. When every morning you wake up and you see your vision board, right? People have this vision board in their room where they have their car, which they want to get one day. They have their ideal job, which they want to get one day. All of those things. What happens when you wake up every single day and you look at that? It serves as a reminder and motivation for you that I need to work hard towards these things. So when that day you face a difficulty of do I you know, chase the bread, okay? Or do I chase just chilling and doing nothing and playing games? You remember the stuff you saw that morning in your vision board and you say, okay, let me make that decision, it becomes easier for you. That's what dhikr does. When you're constantly talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying the name even of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, these things, anytime you come across a decision where you have to choose between obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and obedience to something else or disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that decision becomes so much more easier, right? And when you make the du'as that you are prescribed to make, for example, after waking up, Alhamdulillah ladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatina. All praise be to, be to the one who gave us life after he took it away from us. What that does is it creates a sense of desperation in you since you understand every single day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who gives me life and takes it away from me. So when you're making dua, you understand that there's no power except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's easier for those tears to flow now. It's easier for you to ask Allah sincerely now, right? So make sure that you make dhikr 
a regular habit for yourself. Whether that is your prescribed du'as before sleeping, after sleeping, before entering the bathroom, after leaving, or just regular subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, these kinds of things. When it comes to du'a, everyone knows this. What is the du'a that um, the Prophet ﷺ is said to have made the most in Ramadan, especially in the last 10, last 10 days and last 10 nights, is Allahumma innaka afuwun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni. Okay? Allahumma, oh Allah, innaka afuwun, indeed you are forgiving. Tuhibbul um, afwa, you love to forgive, fa'afu anni. So forgive me, ya Allah. The thing with afwa, and I've heard Imam Akram mention this in khutbahs before, but I'll mention it again. The thing with afwa is that it's a bit different from regular istighfar. Istighfar is regular forgiveness where you commit a sin, and on the day of judgment, it's likened to that sin being mentioned that you committed and it being striped across. So you're not punished for it, but you can still kind of see that you committed that sin. Allah has forgiven you for that sin. Afwa instead is that sin is written down in that book of yours, whatever, 10 years ago, five years ago, whenever you committed that sin. When you ask for afwa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're asking to be pardoned. So not only is that sin forgiven, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely erases that sin. He completely removes that sin. So on that day of judgment, you don't even see that sin on your book. You don't even see that sin when your deeds are being discussed. And subhanAllah, reminder for myself before anyone else, how scary is it when we think of the fact that on that day, everything we've done in private will be exposed. Everything that we've done in private will be exposed. The backbiting that we did of other people, how we cursed other people behind their back, but not even that. Your habits in private, all of those things will be exposed on the day of judgment. So if you make it a habit to make this dua, Allahumma innaka afuwun, tuhibbul afwa, fa'afu anni ya kareem. Um, Insha'Allah, those sins, not only will they be forgiven, but they will be completely hidden on the day of judgment, completely removed, inshallah. So make it a habit to do that. One of the things, again, with daily affirmations, like we mentioned, is that it helps you stay on track since you're reminding yourself of something consistently. Afwa is you're seeking forgiveness, you're seeking to be pardoned from two things. First is your sins. So when you make the dua consistently and you come across something that you're about to sin, you're about to commit a sin, automatically you remember that what is the point of me making this dua 24-7 if immediately I'm going to sin right now, let me stay away from it. So you consistently making that dua helps you stay away from that sin. But the second one for afwa is you're asking for forgiveness in the shortcomings of your ibadah. When you don't have enough khushu' in your salah, when you're not reciting Quran with intentionality, it's just words on a page that you're going through, when you're not being nice towards others, those are shortcomings in the things that you've been prescribed to do. And you seek forgiveness through, for that through this dua as well. When you make it a consistent, ha consistent habit to make this dua, and you stand for prayer, you tell yourself that, let me be more intentional in my salah, so that that dua that I've been thinking about consistently, inshallah, I don't even have to ask forgiveness, of course you still ask for forgiveness, but I don't even have to ask since I'm not committing those mistakes again. So think about, those two act aspects of forgiveness from your sins, but also from the shortcomings in your prayers and your um, other things. The fourth thing is, so we have salah, your focus on the Quran, your dhikr and dua. The fourth thing is sadaqa in these last 10 days and 10 nights. The Prophet ﷺ has mentioned that he would be the most generous in the month of Ramadan. And in these last 10 nights, of course, everyone would increase in what they were doing in the previous 20 days and 20 nights. So it's fair to assume that the Prophet ﷺ would increase his, in his generosity in these last 10 days and last 10 nights. So be more generous in your sadaqah. If you can't, I understand this has been a uh, um, tough year for the ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aid our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Gaza and get, grant them victory over their oppressors. And we've given a lot in many different causes for Islam. So I understand it might be a bit tough on our pockets right now. Might be a bit constrained, restrained. But the ulama say that give until you're comfortable or give until it's uncomfortable to give more and then give a little bit more, okay? So even if it's $10, not $100, not $1,000 that makes you uncomfortable, even if it's $10 that is making you a bit uncomfortable in the sense that you're questioning now that do I, can I really give this? Can I really afford to give this extra $10? Give those $10. 
or give that extra dollar. Because now it becomes a true mujahada, it becomes a true sense of striving against yourself, fighting against what your nafs is saying. And now the money doesn't matter, that intention and the effort matters. Inshallah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you much more than He rewards those people who donate millions of dollars, but it's an afterthought to them. Not because they want to give, but because, you know we hear of billionaires giving millions and millions to charity or whatnot, and oftentimes everyone just knows that it's a form of tax write-off, right? So that in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who's doing it just says, oh, I have some money, let me just give it so that this person doesn't bother me. Versus a child who gives us um, like $10 that he has earned from his hard work and that's all the $10 he has. Those $10 are much more impactful and much more beautiful in the, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than someone giving, you know, maybe $1,000 but it really doesn't mean anything to them. So give and then give a little bit more just enough to make you uncomfortable. And then the second thing is, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, The best, the most beloved of deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ones that are the most consistent, even if they're small. Right? So you've probably seen everyone send links saying automate your um, donations for the last 10 days, last 10 nights, so that you make sure you're donating at least a small amount. And if you catch the night of power, Laylatul Qadr, then incredible, inshallah. You've donated a massive amount, 83 years worth of $10, whatever, more than 83 years. I will say, however, that automate whatever you are able to give, whatever is comfortable for you to give, automate that amount. But set an alarm, your, uh, alarm for yourself or set something for yourself where you're intentionally giving an amount every single day. Because that intentionality every single day, inshallah, that itself will have its own reward. Even if you're adding quite literally one dollar every single day of intentional to the masjid, to zakah, uh, to sadaqah, whatever it is. But intentionally make it an effort every single day to give a little bit. But don't miss out on these last 10 nights by not giving and forgetting to give. So automate, but also intentionally give just a little bit every single day. And then the last one that I'll mention for these five action items for these things is, I mean for these last 10 days, is focus on your akhlaq. That's, I think, one of the the biggest things. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentions that he was sent to perfect a person's akhlaq. He was sent to per perfect our character, our how we deal with other people, right? So make sure that you're dealing with others in the best of manners. When we're fasting, what happens is we tend to get a little bit irritable. You get, you know, it's known as hangry. Everyone gets a little bit hangry. You come for iftar at the masjid, there's not enough iftar, or some, there, you know, someone else is being served first and you're mad and you're angry. That's not right. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, الصبر عند السدمة الأولى Patience is at the first strike of calamity. So when you are feeling hangry, when you are feeling irritable, when you are feeling, you know, not in your best phase, that's the best time for you to be extra nice to people. Okay? Best time for you to be extra nice. Not in the condescending way, where, you know, they're like, oh, um, I really like you. And, you know, they say it in a way where, you know, this guy really doesn't like me at all. Not in a con condescending way, but just to make sure that you're not letting that anger seep out, you're extra nice, right? So make sure that fasting, you kind of put the cherry on top of the cake by being extra nice to people. In these last 10 nights of worship, I'll mention something um, in the next portion, which might seem a little bit contradictory to what I'm saying now. But in these last 10 nights, make sure you're doing things that are helping other people. If you're at the masjid, you know, the person next to you praying, they move, this is a tiny thing. They move in salah and you move again to, you know, join the saf with them. And their bottle was down there. Not in salah, of course. Their bottle was in front of them. Bend down, give them the bottle before they can bend down. Those tiny things, inshallah, when you do them with int intentionality, it builds a community. It gets a community closer, inshallah. So not just for yourself, but for the community generally. Acts of kindness can get you entered into Jannah. We heard about the woman who used to sell her body as a profession. She gave water to a thirsty cat, some say a thirsty dog, and that was enough for her to be entered into Jannah, into Jannah, right? So acts of kindness itself, if done in the right way, can get you in Jannah, inshallah. So look at it as not as a waste of time per se, but more so as a way to, as another way to kind of diversify your portfolio, right? We're in Seattle, we've got tech bros, tech sisters everywhere. Diversify your portfolio with these five forms of um, practical items. So salah, your prayers, focusing on the Qur'an, dhikr and dua, sadaqah, and focusing on your akhlaq, your manners. 
one thing that's very important is make sure you do diversify your actions. What happens often is you're standing for Qiyam at your, at, at your house, right? You've prayed Qiyam at the Masjid or before you come to the Masjid, those two, three hours that you have, you're praying for your, with yourself at your home. You're praying by yourself at home, which is highly, highly recommended. That's ideal is you make sure you're spending a lot of times in individual worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But um, you get tired a little bit. Your legs start aching or you've been reciting so much Quran, your throat dries up. Don't take that as an excuse to say that, okay, now let me go chill. Let me watch some TV. Let me watch this. Let me read, you know, maybe a novel or something. I don't know why someone is doing that in this month. But anyway, um, uh, make sure you diversify. If your legs are genuinely tired, sit down, read some Quran. If your throat dries up, do some dhikr. If that doesn't happen, find someone in your house you can do khidmah. Up. If you live with your parents, that's a massive reward for you already. Not inherently, but massive potential for reward since you can go and help your parents out. Get them a glass of water while they're, uh, they're doing their ibadah. Maybe do the dishes so your uh, family doesn't have to do it. Make sure you're diversifying your ibadah. And when you get tired of one thing, come back to the other thing. That cycle can go on and on and on. And then what also happens is the Prophet ﷺ, it's mentioned, Aisha radiallahu anha mentions that some nights when he would be praying his tahajjud, he would spend um, literally hours in, in qiyam, in standing. Some nights he would spend that amount of time in sajda. Sajda, what happens is you typically make dua. When you're qiyam, when you're standing, what happens is you're reciting Quran. So sometimes you feel more like reading and reflecting on the ayahs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes you want to make dua more, right? So listen to yourself, listen to what is going to get you the most benefit for yourself, what you're going to do the most sincerely, and do that thing. You don't have to necessarily sit and read eight adza of Qur'an in one sitting because that's your goal, and you're not feeling it. La. Read your goal, read whatever you think is important for you, at least a little bit, at least one juice, bare minimum. At least one juice, read it. But then if you're feeling desperate in that situation, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fall into sajda, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever it is that you want to ask for. There are prophetic du'as that you can memorize, which is great. But if you don't feel a du'a, if you don't understand a certain du'a, then in those long sessions of du'a, make sure you're saying things you understand and make sure you're saying things that come from your heart. Right? Make sure they're coming sincerely from your heart, even if they're not per se a prophetic du'a that the Prophet ﷺ made. Because every one of us has different situations. Every one of us is going through things that maybe two days ago we weren't, Two days after today, we won't. So every dua will be different and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands. So any language, inshallah, that's fine. Diversify your areas of focus. Five, I mentioned again before I move on and kind of wrap up with my final discussion is salah, prayer, focusing on the Quran, dhikr and dua, sadaqah, and focusing on your akhlaq. In dua, the dua that we should make 24 seven. If we're walking to the car, um, between salah, right, between when the imam um, is sitting and when he's going to stand up again. Istighfar, of course, but then, Allahumma innaka arfuwun tuhibbul arfwa fa'arfuwani. Memorize that dua if you haven't already, and literally, any moment you see that your tongue is not moving, recite that dua. Any, any, any moment you notice that your tongue isn't moving, recite that dua, inshaAllah. Okay, so the last thing that I kind of wanted to talk about, which was supposed to take most of my time, but um, will end inshallah ideally on time is the spirit of the last 10 nights okay how we should approach these last 10 nights what kind of psyche mentality should we have going into these last 10 nights like I mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a few ayahs it starts off with Kutiba alaykum al siyam right I'm sure you've heard that ayah and those portions a dozen times in this month of Ramadan which you should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks, and if you haven't, by the way, please go and read the tafsir, at least a basic tafsir of these ayahs, because it'll benefit. Surah Baqarah 1, 186, 186 I believe, from there until a few ayahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the purpose of Ramadan and some goals that you can get from it. La'allakum, la'alla means so that, perhaps, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a lot of things, and then he mentions quite a few times la'alla. So it starts off with la'allakum tattaqun, taqwa. Then he says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Shukr, to have gratitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he speaks about dua later on in the next ayah. And then he ends it off with again, لَعَلَّهُمْ So there's another, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that they may be guided. And then it ends off again with, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ So that they may have taqwa. So you have taqwa, shukr, 
um, dua and guidance. All four of these things are internal actions. All four of them. Taqwa is God consciousness. I, I heard from some shaykh, beautiful. He said that khawf, typically taqwa, people say fear of God, right? Which is correct in a sense. He said that the difference between khawf and taqwa, because khawf also in, uh, in Arabic means fear. Khawf is when you fear God, right? Taqwa is when you get that feeling of fear in God and then you change your actions because of that feeling. So you're not just feeling a certain way, but you're actually doing something. Umar ibn Khattab described taqwa, I believe um, Imam Akram mentioned this in his talk. Umar ibn Khattab mentioned, described taqwa as, if you're walking with a new garment and there's a bunch of thorns on your road, you pick up your thobe because you're trying to be extra careful, right? If someone said, I have fear of the thorns and walked with their thobe, letting the thorns prick their thobe and cut the thobe, everyone's going to be like, what is wrong with you? You say you have fear of it, you understand that it's going to harm you, but you do nothing to counteract that. Versus taqwa is you understand, you have that fear, you understand the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and out of that consciousness and love and fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't do certain things. There's also, um, I was gonna say something, but I'm not. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna control myself. There's also, right, one thing is that don't always have, unfortunately, some people look at taqwa and this sense of God consciousness, God fearing, as a negative thing. They're saying, why should I always fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But, okay, I'm gonna say it, right? There's a character in some show, all right, who says, who was asked that, and this is very like tongue in cheek, very dumb comment by him, but when I thought about it, and of course, anything that you listen to, you want to reflect on it, and when you reflect on anything, try to um, think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end. Because any, any, anything that thinks you, makes you think deeply, makes you think greatly, you should try to connect it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the purpose of life, okay? Um, I'm trying to balance that with this. So he was asked, right, in the end when he was leaving the show or whatever, that would you prefer that your colleagues or your employees or whatever, would you prefer that they love you or that they fear you? Okay, and he responded and he said, easy, both. I want them to be afraid of how much they love me. Okay, now that quote itself, tweak it a little bit. But when I was thinking of taqwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what I thought about is, yes, you have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that fear isn't necessarily of his punishment. A lot of that fear is that you're scared that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to give you the love that he has been giving you forever. So you're afraid of the fact that you're going to lose the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How beautiful is that? Instead of looking at constantly, now of course the Qur'an, whenever Allah mentions reward, He also mentions punishment. Because the human condition is, we need both the carrot and the stick. Parking, for example, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten tickets coming to Map Seattle. But um, parking, if someone just said that if you park further away, I'll give you a cookie, right? Most people won't park further away because they're like, whatever, I don't want a cookie. Some days you want a cookie, so you're going to park further when we walk. Versus when you say that if you park further away, I'll give you a cookie. But if you park closer to the masjid, if you park in this area, I'm going to tow your car. Some days you're going to do it for the cookie. And some days you're going to do it so that your car isn't towed. Right? So you need both the carrot and the stick. Some days you feel like when you read what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for you in Jannah, they will have whatever they desire in there. And we have even more for them. You hear that and you're just like, Ya Allah, I want a piece of this. I want this so badly. But then some days you're not feeling it the same way. When you hear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa uh, that, The ayah right before that. Sorry, this is the hardest thing is to think of the ayah before. Is, يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمَ هَلِمْتَ لَأْتِي وَتَقُولُ هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that that day we'll ask Jahannam that do you have any more space? Are you full? Because there's so many people that have been thrown in. Are you full? Jahannam will kind of ramp up its fire or kind of fuel up even more and it'll say, are there more people? Can you put more people? Right? So some days you need that fear. When you hear that you're so scared and you say, Ya Allah, I'm so afraid of your punishment, I'm going to stay away from anything that is wrong. But immediately after that, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions literally the next ayah, wa uzlifatil jannatul mutq. That Jannah is brought forward for those who have taqwa. Some days you need that ayah and you tell yourself that, Ya Allah, I want that Jannah. So you need the carrot and the stick. So when you think of taqwa, don't just always think of it as fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you don't want to be punished by Him. Yes, of course. But also think of that fear as losing His love. The fear of losing the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want you ask, guys to ask yourself genuinely that when we walk outside of this masjid, you don't even have to go far. We're on Capitol Hill. When we walk out of this masjid, unfortunately, we see people who are not to blame them, not to laugh at them. They're in complete and utter confusion of what the purpose of this life is. They have no guidance for wh where they need to go, how they need to go about things. And they're just going about life, just fulfilling their desires. The past few days I've been going to Islamic House, which is the masjid in MSA, which is the masjid in Europe, Seattle. For the, how many have been to Islamic House, by the way, show of hands. Let's get some audience interaction going on. There's like a few people, okay. The thing about Islamic House is in, it's in the middle of Greek Row. Greek Row, for everyone who knows, is Fitna Central. It's where you have sororities and where you have fraternities. And if you go there at night, you know, Forget lowering your gaze, you need to get rid of your gaze completely. Because there's people out there going from one house to another for partying, and it's crazy, absolutely insane. In the middle of that, you have Islamic house, right? So we're walking in thobes and kufis because you have street parking, no one wants to pay. So you street park next to some frat, and there's one group of frat bros going to some sorority or going to some other frat, and they got Bud Lights and Coors or whatever, don't ask me how I know those. But um, they're walking to their party, whatever, and usually they have music while they're walking with them. And then you have this bunch of like six dudes with thobes and kufis on, or like looking down or walking through, running into each other because we're trying not to run into the others. And that makes you reflect sometimes that what really is their life? Anytime they want something that their lowest self, Imam uh, Sharif, he, he talked about basal desires, your absolute lowest self. When you want something your lowest self desires, they have no issue in saying that, let me go get this, let me go get this, let me go get this. Absolutely zero self-control, right? Versus us, we've just fasted the whole day, staying away from things that are halal, typically speaking. The night, we could be doing so many other things, forget partying, we could be doing things that are halal, just chilling with our friends and talking and laughing, but no. We're there at the masjid to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're sacrificing on our, um, our time, our desires, just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you notice the guidance that you've been blessed with, you have so much shukr for the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, with, given to you. So we should always have that fear of, Ya Allah, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا Ya Allah, don't misguide my heart after you've given it the sweetness of guidance. So when you think of taqwa, don't always just think of fear of punishment, but also think of fear of losing the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah always, always give us His love and may He not take our soul except that we're going straight to Jannatul Firdaus, inshaAllah. So, la'allakum tattaqoon, internal. Taqwa is completely internal. You're reflecting, always. Shukr is also internal, right? Because you have to recognize your faults, you have to recognize your blessings that you have been given and then be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, shukr is in internal. Um, Rushd, guidance, is also internal. You can pray as much as you want. Um, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet وسلم, that there's a group from amongst the Bedouins who come to you and tell you that we have believed. We have iman now. Tell them that you haven't believed yet, you've submitted. So there's a difference over here. And even Hadith Jibreel, there's a difference between Islam and Iman. Islam is just submission. You can be a Muslim, technically speaking, I'm getting very technical here. You can be a Muslim but not have an ounce of Iman in your heart. Because what, what makes you a Muslim in the public eye? You say a few words, you do salah, right? Even if you don't have khushur in salah, how is everyone else gonna know? That's it, that's basically all you need. Of course you fulfill other fara'id, but all of them are on the outward. Iman is when you have genuine belief in your heart. So guidance, yarshudun, that guidance is when it's in your heart, that's internal. Okay? So taqwa, shukr, guidance, internal, and then dua is, again we spoke about how dua, it comes from a place of desperation. 
you only feel desperate when you're genuinely honest with yourself and honest with the role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plays in your life. That's again, internal. I can sit like this after salah, right? And I can cry, but I could be faking it. You should never, ever, ever assume anyone is faking it, by the way. But ask yourself genuinely that when you're making dua and you're crying, you could be faking it, absolutely. So it's an internal thing. Your sincerity is completely an internal thing. My point of mentioning these things as internal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clearly telling us in the Qur'an that the biggest purposes of Ramadan is to look to your inside, to look to your internal and reflect on those things. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what he would do in this month, in the last 10 days especially, some say even longer, was i'tikaf, which was he would remove himself from society, stay in the masjid, sleep in the masjid, spend as much time as he possibly could in the masjid apart from necessary needs and avoid his interactions with unnecessary things, unnecessary conversations. It's mentioned that Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that when the last 10 nights would come in, the Prophet sallallahu would shed the mi'zarahu, he would tighten his belt. Now this metaphorically means you buckle down, you get ready for the last 10 nights, you roll up your sleeves and you say, I'm going to go full on. I'm going to go, you know, put on the turbos. But some of the ulama, they also mentioned that one of the interpretations of shadda mi'zarahu is that the Prophet ﷺ would avoid spending the nights with his wife when it was permissible, okay? He would avoid spending the nights with his wife even in the last 10 nights simply because, we'll speak about this a little bit more, these last 10 nights, your purpose in them, the primary goal is try as much as you can to reflect on yourself. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ, there was a mutual understanding between his wives, between um, anyone that he chose not to spoke to. They understood that it's not a form of oppression when the Prophet ﷺ is doing this to them, because they understood that, okay, yeah, these 10 nights, we're going to go all in. So if you have, for example, parents who are sick or who are older, don't say that these last 10 nights, I'm going to focus on myself, and you're not helping them walk to the bathroom. You're not giving them their medications. لا, that's not right. Imam Sharif, he speaks about that Ibn Atallah, he mentions, Ibn al he mentions that when someone desires to be freed of all of their responsibilities, that itself is a negative form of desire. You've been given certain responsibilities by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always say that, Ya Allah, remove these responsibilities from me so I can always worship you, can sometimes turn into a negative form of desire. Okay, so I'm not saying that in these last 10 nights, don't fulfill your obligations. What I'm saying is, as much time as you potentially can, take these last 10 nights for yourself. Our teacher, Imam Akram Anais, he has this concept of noise pollution. But not, not noise pollution that you can hear, like literally physical noise pollution, spiritual noise pollution, all right? And he says that, how many have been sightseeing, by the way? You guys live in Seattle, next to Mount Rainier? You have to go sightseeing. I, not sightseeing, sorry, astaghfirullah. Stargazing. How many have been stargazing? Okay, if you haven't, please do, inshallah. To like reflect on the bounties and beauties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stargazing, for those who haven't been, what you're supposed to do is light pollution. Even when you're sleeping, they say you don't use blue light for like hour, or half an hour before you go to sleep because that stays in your eyes for a certain time even after using them. And that's the thing with stargazing is they say you need to stop using your phones and other forms of artificial light before you start stargazing, at least half an hour, 45 minutes, so that you can see better, right? And this is 100% true, I've experienced it. It's not like a spiritual secret, it's just science, right? So there's some things that you can do which remove the pollution, and there's some things which can do which speed in the process of removing the pollution, which is you turn on red lights around your eyes, right? A certain kind of red lights, which speed in that process of getting rid of whatever the blue light or whatever it is. So that helps in stargazing, and you'll see a lot of people who go stargazing have a red headlamp. Our teacher, he says that our souls get polluted as well, okay? Our souls, when we spend a lot of time around people and with people talking about things and doing things that are not necessary, that are not about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what happens is that your souls get polluted. And what happens when pollution surrounds something is that it's harder for you to get full benefit of what that thing is. So your ruh, your soul, the purpose of it is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, when it gets polluted and surrounded by things, 
it becomes harder for you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you have to push through all of those cobwebs. What fasting does is that it brushes away some of those cobwebs. You've just spent 12, 13, 14 hours fighting against your lowest desires of wanting to eat, wanting to drink, wanting to do anything that you want to do. What that does is it gives your soul a ray of sunshine. One of the great thinkers of the subcontinent, he draws this parallel and he says that when you fast, or he says that in the build-up to Ramadan, usually what happens in 11 months is we've deprived our soul of the food and nourishment that it deserves, which is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the Qur'an, it's dhikr, it's thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've deprived it for 11 months of the nourishment that it deserves to the point where it's passed out. Imagine someone running on a marathon who hasn't had water and they pass out, okay? You don't go to that person and shove water in that person's mouth and make them gulp it down. That's not going to help because they're passed out. What do you do? You take some water and you sprinkle it on that person's face. Now that person wakes up and that person realizes that there's water nearby. I have water in my reach and that person desires water even more. When they take that sip of water, it benefits him so much more. Versus when he's still unconscious, if you try to shove it down his throat, it's not really going to benefit him, right? He says that when you fast, what happens is you clear those cobwebs and you sprinkle a little bit of water, a little bit of nourishment of the soul onto your soul. You teach it that, look at me, I am, potential, I am capable of staying away from my lowest desires. And your ruh, your soul wakes up and it says, what is this? I need more of this. You're listening to the commands of Allah. You're sacrificing on your life because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is this? I need more of this. This is the nourishment that was decided for me. So you break your fast, you open your fast, you've just sprayed some water onto the face of the soul. It would be cruelty to now not feed any water to that soul. So he says, praying Qur'an, doing taraweeh, doing qiyam in this month, not doing those would be cruelty to your soul because you've given it those few drops of water and now you're not feeding it its, it its nourishment. So that's why after you finish fasting, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, that fasting has been prescribed upon you fardan, it's, been, it's an obligation for you. And qiyam, tahajjud, praying uh, long, praying during the night has been prescribed upon you taqabwaan, as a form of um, choice. But this choice, when you get rid of it completely, becomes a form of cruelty to your soul. So what happens in this month of Ramadan is, you give your soul a little bit of that taste. You show it a little bit of that sunshine. Now it wants to go out and play. What happens in Seattle when we see sunshine outside? We run outside to spend some time outside. These last 10 nights, what you want to do is you want to maximize the nourishment that you give your soul. You want to maximize the time that you're spending getting rid of that noise pollution. The Prophet ﷺ, the more you get rid of, by the way, the noise pollution, the spiritual pollution around your soul, the easier it becomes to see certain secrets. This is the entire kind of science of tasawwuf, of spirituality, right? Is you do a lot of adhkar, you do a lot of nafil prayers, you do a lot of um, staying away from certain things, so that it becomes easier for you to see the beauty in this world. It becomes easier for you to see the be beauty in the Qur'an. I promise I'll wrap up soon, sorry. So, what is the greatest message that the Prophet ﷺ ever, ever received? That any human being could ever receive? Not that, no. What is the greatest message? Answer, I'm not asking uh, rhetorically. What is the greatest message that the Prophet ﷺ ever, ever received, ever got? Quran, very good. What was the habit of the Prophet ﷺ right before he revealed, uh, the, the Quran was revealed to him? Where was the Qur'an revealed to him? Okay, sorry, I'm going to quiz you guys. I know you're fasting, but I'm going to quiz you. Where was the first revelation of the Qur'an to the Prophet ﷺ? Ghara Hira, the cave of Hira. Why did the Prophet ﷺ go to Ghara Hira? Okay, I'll tell you quickly so that we're saving time. Uh, you guys know, of course, but people are shy. Okay, um, the reason why the Prophet ﷺ would go to Ghara Hira, Khadija radiallahu anha, would pack food for him and he would go to Ghara Hira, was he realized how much he was taking in things that were unnecessary for his ruh, for his soul. He realized how much his spiritual self was getting polluted and surrounded by these things which were distracting him from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he would go and spend 
Sometimes Khadija radiallahu anha, it's narrated from her that she would say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would sometimes spend days on end. He would spend days on end in the cave of Hira before coming back. And this was of course, they both understood Khadija radiallahu anha, anha and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because there was a give and take. I'll talk about the give and take, inshallah I'll end there. When the Prophet ﷺ was able to clear out all of that spiritual kind of... Pollution is a tough term when you're using it for the Prophet ﷺ, but unnecessary things surrounding your nafs, what happened is now his heart was ready for the Qur'an. Even then, how hard was the first revelation of the Qur'an? The Prophet ﷺ describes that it was so, so difficult. Jibreel ﷺ held him so tight, it felt like his ribs were about to crack. It felt like he was about to, you know, so scary. So when we're spending this month, last 10 days, and we want to, we think about the entire year that, Ya Allah, why is it that I don't taste the khushua in my prayers? Why is it that when I stand up for tahajjud, my tears aren't flowing? Why is it that when my forehead kisses the ground, I don't have any intentional du'as to make from my heart? That's because a lot of the times there's so much pollution in our hearts around our spiritual selves that it becomes hard for us to listen to and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set up for us. So these last 10 days, it was a habit of the Prophet ﷺ to make i'tikaf, to completely turn away from things that are unnecessary. And I'm going to advise and remind and recommend for myself first before anyone else, try to make that our habit today. If you walk into the masjid, for example, if I walk into the masjid and I see Imam Akram or I see Habibi Abdul Rahman, and I see them reading Quran, say salam, there's a lot of benefit in saying salam. But maybe for these 10 days, Avoid talks that aren't spiritual or religious in nature, okay? There's no harm in talking about other things, absolutely not. In fact, sometimes there might even be reward. But these 10 days and 10 nights, you want to spend them with yourself. Reflect on yourself. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he gave his first kind of sermon to the community, when the Muslim community was first established in Medina, he mentioned four things. Afshu salam, spread, spread peace and, and blessings Yani, what does it say when you say salam to people? Salutations? Greet people, sorry, I'm fasting, okay? Greet people, he says greet people a lot, spread that greeting. وَطَعِمُ الطَّعَامُ Feed people a lot, okay? وَصِلُوا الْأَرْحَامُ And connect with your family to make sure that you're not breaking off your family. These three things, by the way, are things that happen the most in the month of Ramadan. You see people much more than you see them typically, so you're saying salam a lot more. You feed people more for iftar and suhoor than you do any time in the year, so you're doing wat'aim al ta'am more. You connect with your family more and you're having more time spending with your family, so you do wasallu al more. And the fourth thing is what you do the most of, which is wasallu bil layli wa nasu niyam. Pray at night when everyone else is asleep. So the secret to having a good community is not just doing things on the outward and doing things with others. But a very, very, very big secret, I will say, I'll go so far as to say, the biggest secret to having a successful community is every individual person works on themselves. Hurt people hurt people, right? People who are themselves hurt, they end up hurting others, right? Hurt people hurt people. Work on yourself these last 10 days. Even if you feel like you're not having as much fun because you come to the masjid and you chill with your friends, no harm in that. If you're doing that, there's reward in it as long as you're not talking about bad stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. But take these 10 days, take these 10 nights, reflect on things. Imam Umar Suleiman recently had a talk and he mentioned that one of the things you can do is after iftar until suhoor, try to avoid any conversation that isn't religious. Okay? Try to avoid any conversation that isn't religious. Even in the masjid, say salam, how are you doing? Khalas. You read your Quran, they're reading their Quran. You do your qiyam, they're doing their qiyam, whatever. But make sure you're spending time to clear out that spiritual pollution in your heart and prepare yourself, prepare your soul to intake the beauty that is Islam, to intake the beauty that is the Qur'an in the rest of the year, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit. I mentioned one last thing, okay? And this is again in Urdu. I promise I keep saying last thing. I have so many things because I wanted to spend only like 15 minutes on the first two topics. I wanted to spend a lot of time on this third one because there's so many gems, right? But, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's Laylatul Qadr. Uh, we should spend more time, like I'm saying, personal ibadah, so I'll try to end off very soon. Um, let's see in my notes if there's something that I really want to mention. When you work on yourself, you'll be more capable of working with others and benefiting others, right? So 
That's why hurt people hurt people, okay? Um, take these 10 days as a form of spiritual retreat. Cut down on your other actions, even if it's interacting with others. Like I said, the purpose I mentioned is the Prophet ﷺ say, he wouldn't even spend the nights with his wives in these last 10 nights. Completely permissible. In fact, there's reward in it, right? There's reward in that action. But he understood, and the wives of the Prophet understood, the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, all of them understood, that we need to focus on ourselves sometimes. Islam is not a religion that says that you're monks, you go live alone in villages and you go live around. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. But sometimes you need to reflect on yourself. Sometimes you need time for yourself. Sometimes you need to prioritize your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll end with this statement. Okay, Bismillah. I promise I'll end with this. It's in Urdu, okay? So forgive me, I'm going to say it in English as well. And it's not going to be the same in English because of, it's a, it's a little bit of a wordplay. I'm going to try to say it in uh, Arabic because I think it'll have some impact on Arabic. I've kind of made it up myself two minutes ago in Arabic in my head. So forgive me if um, it's that, it's Fusha Arabic. At least I'm trying for it to be Fusha. So if you speak, you know, Umm Dunya people, or if you speak Darija, that's not even Arabic. If you speak one of those, I'm sorry. If you don't understand, but whatever. I'll translate it in English anyway. There was a visiting scholar a couple days ago um, in Seattle, very, very uh, senior scholar, Mufti Muhammad Sab. He's a teacher and he's been teaching Sahih al-Bukhari for like 20 years, I believe. He mentioned that, again, he spoke about how the purpose of Ramadan is to look at yourself, your inner spiritual self and try to improve it so that the rest of the year you can work with others better. He mentioned that after we pass away, either in our graves or on the Day of Judgment. And this, is, this isn't something like, um, that is like per se going to happen, but it's just something general. That after we pass away, we'll probably be asked by angels, now here's the Urdu part, forgive me. The angels or someone will ask us, Ki tum kya ban kar aai? Okay, tum kya ban kar aai? And most people, for people who know Urdu, try to think about this. Most people will have no response except saying, Main bahut kuch bana kar aaya. Right? So you'll be asked, Kya ban kar aaya? And most people will only be able to respond with, Main bahut kuch bana kar aaya. Okay? For those people who know Urdu, hopefully you understand how deep that is. Right? Now, for the people who I'm kind of teasing with the Urdu, I'll say it in English, then I'll try my best at uh, saying it in Arabic with kind of the same eloquence. The angels or whoever will ask you that what have you become? What have you made yourself into in this world? Right? What have you transformed yourself into in this world? Because this conversation is happening with your ruh, with your soul. And a lot of people, may Allah not make us from amongst them, a lot of people will have no answer except for saying, I've made a lot of other things. I've transformed a lot of other things. Your purpose for being sent into this world is to craft and perfect your spiritual self in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a lot of people when they're asked that question, they say that, yeah, I made a lot of things. I made a mil millions of dollars. I made three houses. I made four kids who are incredible. They're all hufal. I made a family, a community, which is incredible. But when you're asked what you did for yourself, what you made yourself into, you have no response because you never worked on yourself. Life to you always was, let me try to help others, let me try to make more money, let me try to make more houses. But you never looked at your primary purpose of your life, which was to transform your soul into something. So no one will have an answer for that, or most people will not have an answer for that, because too late do they realize that I'm not here to make houses, I'm not here to make, you know, max out my 401k, great if you're doing that, I'm not here to do that. My purpose is to make myself into a better Muslim, make myself into a better worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Now, the part you've been waiting for, I'm gonna try that out of you, okay? Let me try to pick the right word. I've built it up so much now that regardless of what I say, it's gonna be bad. Okay, so you're going to be asked, anyone who knows sarf, you'll benefit, otherwise, too bad. Ma khuliqta, okay? Ma khuliqta. And people will only be able to respond saying, khuliqtu kathira. No, sorry, khalaqtu kathira. 
You will be asked that what have you been made into, what have you made yourself into, and the only response they'll be able to give is, I've made others into a lot. All right? Um, again, if you know Urdu, great. If you don't, I'm sorry, your loss. But make sure that these last 10 nights, okay, I'm closing this so you know I'm ending here. Make sure these last 10 nights you're focusing on yourself a lot. That doesn't mean neglecting your family, that doesn't mean neglecting your siblings, your spouse. But understand that if you don't work on yourself, you won't really be able to benefit those around you in a positive manner. There's a corporate theory, again, this is not in my notes, but I'm, I keep going, sorry. There's a corporate theory of, there's three concentric circles, in the middle of it is you. You have the closest, the smallest one, which is the circle of control, things that you can actually control, people you can actually control. Then the other circle around it is a little bit bigger, the circle of influence, people who you have a little bit of influence over, you can't control them, but there's some influence, and then the last circle is circle of concern. The more times you spend on the inner circles, the more the outer circle will increase, okay? So the more time you spend in your circle of control, the more your circle of influence will increase. That's the exact same thing here. You can control yourself, you can control your nafs, you can control what you do. Make sure these 10 nights, what is remaining of them, you do the absolute most, focus on yourself. Inshallah, may Allah grant us Laylatul Qadr. May Allah forgive each and every one of, us, uh, one of our sins. May Allah grant us the ability to walk out of this Ramadan without a single, single sin on our shoulders. What happens? And believe that, genuinely believe that you're walking out of this Ramadan without a single sin. What happens when you have a lot of sins is you look at your sins when you're about to commit the same sin and you say that, I've been doing the same thing for 20 years. It's so hard for me to stop. Let me just do it one more time. Inshallah, I'll stop the next time. But when you know for a fact, when you know for a fact that that sin has been completely erased from your past, now when you come across it again in Ramadan, when you're backbiting, when you're eating something haram, let's say, when you come across that thing again, you know that if I eat it this time, it's going to start up a new chapter in my book of deeds. Because that old chapter has been erased, it's been removed it becomes easier for you to stay away from it. So focus on yourself, focus on your individual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the aspects of doing that is being kind towards others, fulfilling your rights towards others. So don't neglect others. But as much as you can, be a bit selfish this Ramadan, these last 10 nights. In the best of manners, be a little bit selfish these last 10 nights. Um, and exit these last 10 nights knowing that we've caught the Laylatul Qadr insha'Allah and knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven each and every one of your sins not just forgiven them, He's pardoned them I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the ability to experience and capture the night of Laylatul Qadr I, I, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to exit this month of Ramadan without a single sin on our shoulders I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows our soul and allows us to clear the soul of the cobwebs and the pollution that is surrounding it and truly see the beauty in the message that is the Qur'an and the, and the messenger that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad Jazakum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu I don't know if anyone has questions but I'm not gonna answer, I'm kidding <laughs> If you have questions please ask if it's anything fiqh related Imam Akram can If it's anything on my notes I'd love to answer Jazakum alaykum